Well, it's good to be with you all today. My name is John. This is my wife, Stephanie, down here. And uh, we are planting church experience in Cape Coral, Florida. Maybe some of you know where that is, down uh, southwest Florida near Fort Myers area. And, uh, and so we are privileged to be with you, the CE Chapel, today. And I'm um, sorry, Pastor Kirsch, not here. You know, kind of a, a, one of those things where he has a procedure done and not quite sure what he's going to be able to do, but uh, I'm here to pinch hit. All right, so we're going to have a good morning here, okay? Um, you guys have been in this miracles series. We've been, we've been looking at the miracles of Jesus, and I believe that God is still working miracles today. Do you believe that's true? God is still working miracles today. And today we're going to talk about the miracles God can do in your relationships. I'm so thankful that uh, we took communion today. Two weeks from today is Easter Sunday. Do you know that? 14 days is Easter Sunday. It's hard to believe it's, it's here. And around this time of year, we start thinking again about the death and resurrection of, of Jesus, don't we? We start thinking about those events that surround that time of, of uh, Jesus' life when he was here on earth. And so with that in mind today, we're going to be looking at the moments surrounding the Last Supper. So it's very appropriate that we took communion and that we were kind of focusing on those types of things. This, of course, was the final meal that Jesus would have with his disciples before the crucifixion. And uh, I want us to begin today, we're going to look at a couple different passages, but I want us to begin today with looking at one particular verse, all right? There's something that the early Christians had that propelled the message of, of the teachings of Jesus forward. It propelled the message and teachings of Jesus past the boundaries. And uh, it was this thing that made the church unstoppable. Say that word, unstoppable. 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 And it began when Jesus gathered with his disciples for this last meal. And I want to read to you half of a verse because you know the second half already. But I want us to pause and just think about this first half of the verse because most of the time we just rush on right by it, Okay. And so Jesus said something that is now so commonplace in our American culture that doesn't even really stick anymore. It's lost its leverage in our culture. But I'm telling you, these words that I'm about to read to you were absolutely revolutionary when they were heard for the first time. So Jesus gathered his disciples together, and in John chapter 13, we're going to jump down to verse 34, and I want us to read the first half of this verse. John 13, verse 34 says... A new command I give you. Stop right there. A new command I give you. Say that word new. New. There's a little Greek word there for new called kainos, which means unusual or unexpected. It's bigger than just our English word for new. This was something brand new. This was something fresh. This was something unheard of until this moment. And so when the disciples heard that word kainos, all right, Matthew got excited. He got his pen out and got to the edge of his seat. And, and John got his pen out and got to the edge of their seat. And, okay, Jesus, we're ready to lay on us. This kainos, this new thing. And Jesus is like, you know, we've got the Ten Commandments. This is like the Eleventh Commandment. Or you've got like over 600 laws in the Old Testament. Well, you've never heard anything like this. This is something brand new. Are you guys ready? We're ready, Jesus. We're ready, Jesus. He says, a new command I give you. The next three words, you guys know it, love one another. Say that with me, love one another. You say, well, that's not new. I knew that. I know that. But it was new for them. I want you to think about what it might have been for them to hear that for the first time. Jesus was uh, saying, you know, I'm talking to you, Peter. You know that grudge you've got against Matthew, that really bad attitude you've got against Matthew? Well, you have to love him. Uh. That's different than put up with. That's different than quit talking behind his back. I want you to love him. I want you to make love a verb. I'm not asking you to feel something, Peter. I want to know if this is going to last, if this is going to work, if this is going to uh, uh, go on. To, I want to introduce you a brand new value system. And listen, this is so big. In this moment, Jesus declares that every human being, every person has value, has worth. There were no qualifiers. He says, I want you to love one another, not just love the ones you like. Love one another. Then Jesus goes on to say in that same verse, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. In other words, as I've shown you, as I have set the example, so now you must love 
one another. So what does that look like for us today? Well, all of us, whether you know it or not, have a set of rules by which you govern your life. These different rules that uh, some of you may not be aware of, some rules that uh, you may have picked up from your families of origin, just how you were raised, some rules you picked up from culture or from people that you admire. We all have these rules, these life rules. And some of these life rules that we have dictate how we handle our relationships. And some of your relationship rules might go like this, and I've written a few of them down here. See if you can identify with these. How about this one? Do unto others as they deserve to be done unto. What do you think? We like this one. Do unto others as they do unto you. Right? Come on now. You might identify with this one. Do unto others as your mood would have it. <laughs> My wife's sitting right here, just so you'll know. I sort of like this one. Do unto others to get them to see things your way. Right? We all have these operating procedures for our relationships, don't we? And we've developed these relationship rules over time, and then many of us became Christ followers. We became Christians. And as we open up the Bible, as we begin to grow in our relationship with Christ, we discover that God's called us to a different standard of living than those rules. A different model of operating when it comes to our relationships. This is what Jesus was saying to his disciples. This is a new thing. This is a new command. This is different than the world's way. This is different than the rules you grew up with, perhaps. This is different. And God says, I don't want you to do unto others as they have done unto you. I want you to do unto others as I have done unto you. Hmm. That is, I want you to begin taking your cues from me, not the world. And as I have treated you, so I want you to treat other people. And instead of responding in like kind or responding in revenge, I want you to focus on what I've done for you, and I want, you to be, I want that to be the standard for how you treat people. We just celebrated communion, reminding us of what God has done for us. And can I just be honest with y'all? Can, can we just act like we've known each other a while here? All right? That's not easy, is it? That's, that's not easy. Because God has unconditionally forgiven me, but I don't know if I really want to unconditionally forgive you because then I feel like I'm just letting you off the hook. Or God has unconditionally accepted me, but I don't know if I want to unconditionally accept you because you're not all that unconditionally acceptable. We're being honest, right? And so this is very difficult. It's not intuitive for us at all. And in several places in Scripture, God says stuff like this. Hey, look, don't get all high and mighty thinking that you and I are on good terms because you go to church or because you know the songs or because you have a quiet time or you spend a lot of time in prayer or you give in the offering. Don't get too caught up in that kind of thinking. Because if you say you love me and you don't treat the people I put around your life very well, then you don't really love me. John puts it this way in 1 John 4, whoever claims to love God yet hates his brother and sister is a liar. In other words, the measure of our relationship vertically is, the measure by the depth, is measured by the depth and maturity of our relationships horizontally. And there's something in me And maybe there's something in you that wants to put those in two different categories. To say something like, I love you, God, but I can't stand him. (laughs) Right? Or I really love you, God, but I don't want to be around her. And I really love you, God, but if they don't change, if you don't change them, it's over. And that's how we want to operate, isn't it? At least that's how I do. That's what comes naturally. But God says it's not that way. I measure the depth and maturity of your love for me by how willing you are to do unto others as I have done to you. That's a whole new command. It's difficult for us. In fact, you might even say it would take a miracle. So to make this really practical for us today, I want us to quickly, quickly look at a few verses in the book of Galatians. We'll be in Galatians chapter 5 for just a little bit. We're going to leave the upper room and look at Galatians chapter 5. Now, Galatians is actually a letter that was written to a group of churches. And let me tell you about this letter because I think that to understand the passion by which it was written will help us. This was written by, as some of you know, a man named Paul, who was a Jewish religious leader who became a Christian. 
And so he understood both sides of Judaism and Christianity. And he's writing this letter to a group of Jewish Christians who are trying to figure out, okay, I know Jesus is the Messiah, but I've got the law of Moses. Now, how do I merge these two things together? Because I grew up thinking that in order to please God, I had to jump so high, duck so low, run so fast, crawl so slow. I had to do all these things in order to please God. And now you're telling me that I'm forgiven. I have a Messiah named Jesus. They died for my sins. So what do I do with the law? So Paul writes this letter to help people understand their perspective on the law. And here's what he says in his letter, Galatians 5. We'll pick it up at verse 13. You are my brothers and sisters. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. All right? Say that word free. Free. Free from what? Free from the law. And earlier in the letter, he basically says that Christ fulfilled the law, and instead of having a relationship with the law as you grew up having, I want you to now focus on a relationship with Christ. You are called to be free from the law. Now, when I hear free from the law, I kind of go back to when I was 16. All right? You know what I'm talking about? When you got your driver's license and you get behind the wheel for the first time all by yourself, I am free from the law, right? Right? I am on my own. Mom and dad aren't going with me. I can go anywhere I want. I can do anything. And you remember, don't you guys, how slow you drove and how careful you were? Uh, Yeah, right. I never knew my parents' car could go so fast. Are you with me? We had this sense in which we were free. We're thinking that there's no more rules. We're going to take total advantage of our now newfound freedom. And so Paul is writing to a group of people, remember, and some of them are starting to get it. They're starting to say things like, we're free. Hey, no more law. We're free. That means I don't have to be nice to you. I don't have to worry about what God thinks. I can sin all I want because I'm going to heaven when I die because Jesus died for my sins. And then there's this other group of people saying, I don't think it works like that. And they're having this debate. And Paul speaks into this debate and writes this letter. And he makes a powerful statement about serving. Now, this principle is so powerful. If you're here today and you're having any kind of relationship difficulties with somebody, and that would be probably all of us to some level, some degree, you're dealing with maybe a family thing, a work thing, a friend thing, a husband thing, a wife thing. There's challenges in all of our relationships. You're dealing with some sort of relationship issue. This principle is so powerfully relationally. So let me read the rest of this verse. Again, verse 13, you, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. And everybody's like, yes, freedom. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Now, what's the flesh? It's that sinful, self-centered nature in us. And don't, don't, everybody's got that, right? Come on. Just because you're free, don't leverage your freedom for your own self-centeredness. Don't think that now that I don't have to be nice to you, I'm not going to be nice to you. Now that I don't have to keep all the rules, I'm not going to keep all the rules. Paul says, don't exercise your freedom like that. He says, and this is, this is key, he says, now that you're free from the law, you have a brand new opportunity. You have a brand new opportunity to now freely choose. Say the word choose. 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 You have an opportunity to freely choose something and freely do some things that before you were commanded to do, but now you're free to choose to do. And that makes a difference, doesn't it? I mean, it's sort of like taking out the trash, all right? Now, I don't mind taking out the trash as long as nobody asks me to do it, right? Or maybe it's emptying the dishwasher, right? Or cleaning up the kitchen after dinner. I mean, if Stephanie asked me to do the dishes, I'm thinking, oh, man, okay, I was just getting ready to do this, right? But if I freely choose to do the dishes, suddenly, da-da-da, I'm husband of the year, right? And when I do the dishes, I like to do the dishes loudly. You know what I'm talking about? So Stephanie knows I'm doing the dishes. Listen, honey. I'm choosing to do the dishes on my own. You didn't have to ask. Clink, 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 clink. I did it just because I love you. Isn't that a whole different thing when somebody asks you to do something and when you freely choose to do it? 
And that's what Paul's getting at here. He says, you know what? You're not under the law anymore. God's not measuring his relationship with you by your performance. That's done and over with. Now that you're free, you can either say, hey, I'm never taking out the trash again. I'm free. Or now that you don't have to, you can freely choose to do it. And in choosing to do it, you create a new opportunity to impact your relationships with other people. Choosing to do it. Now, this is so powerful. Watch, watch what he goes on to say in, in the rest of verse 13. Don't use your freedom to indulge the flesh, the sinful nature, that part of you that basically says, I want to do what only I want to do. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. Say that word, serve. Serve. In other words, here's your opportunity to freely choose to go back towards those people who've disappointed you, back towards those people who have hurt you, back towards those people who are unfair to you, back towards those people you consider to be an enemy. And now that you don't have to, you can freely choose to move in their direction and serve them. Do you know what serve means? Somebody put it this way. I think it's pretty simple to remember. It means this. When you see a need, you meet it. And when there's something to be done, you do it. When you see a need, you meet it. And when there's something to be done, you do it. Say that with me. When you see a need, you meet it. When there's something to be done, you do it. That's pretty easy to remember, isn't it? Not because you have to, because you want to. And now that you're free to choose, you look at the relationships you have with the people in your life, and Paul says, I want you to look for opportunities to serve precisely because you don't have to. And when you choose that, you take a huge step of harnessing that sinful nature in you that says, I only want to do what I want to do. You serve me. You do things my way. And we all have that. And Paul goes on to say in verse 14, for the entire law, the very thing he's trying to get them away from, the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. You guys have heard this before. Love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, all that stuff you've done for years, trying to do, trying to practice, trying to please God for years and years, generation after generation, these Jewish people tried to keep the law. And he says, I can sum it all up in one statement. Here it is. Here's what God wanted the entire time. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, how do you do that? It's real simple. You serve. You see a need and you try to meet it. You see there's something to be done and you do it. It's not an emotion. It's not God. Me and this person are having some problems, and as soon as you heal my heart, no, he says, serve them. Or, okay, as soon as I feel, no, 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 just serve them. Or when they, then I, no, no, just serve them. And again, when you see a need, you meet it. When you see there's something that needs to be done, you do it. That's serving. And then Paul gives a contrast. And I love how Paul writes these contrasts in there. It's as if he says, okay, you don't have to do this, remember? You're not under the law. There's no rules. But if you choose not to do this, if you choose to allow your freedom to appeal to your sinful nature, that selfish part of you that only says, do what I want to do, then this is what's going to happen. Verse 15. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, I don't think he literally meant that, okay? Kind of biting, nitpicking, bickering with each other. Watch out, or you will be, be destroyed by each other. That's a pretty big word, destroyed by each other. In other words, you don't have to serve. You can just keep on living it like it's my way or the highway. I'm going to be in a bad mood. I'm going to complain. I'm going to threaten. Sure, you can run your relationships that way. You can allow that self-centered part of you to rule and reign. That's fine. But if you do that, you'll eventually be destroyed by each other. Paul says if you refuse to meet the needs that you know you could meet and you refuse to do the things that you see need done and you only serve yourself, Eventually, you'll destroy your relationships. And some of you know what I'm talking about. He says, I'll tell you how to break out of that self-centeredness. You make a decision. You choose. It's not a feeling. It's not a wait until the Spirit moves me. It's not a wait until God changes my heart. It's not even wait until I can forgive Him. It's just 
serve one another. Now let me tell you why this is so powerful. When you decide to serve someone who's not on the same page with you, someone you've argued with, maybe an enemy, maybe someone you have a bad attitude towards, maybe somebody who's hurt you, when you decide to serve, here's what happens. You, you break the control of the self-centeredness in your life. Serving destroys self-centeredness. Say that with me. Serving destroys self-centeredness. And we all have that look out for me mentality. The best way to deal with our selfishness is to flat out serve. It's recognizing that there's this thing in me that has the potential to wreck my marriage, wreck my relationship with my kids, wreck my relationship with my parents, wreck my relationships at work. There's this thing in me, this self-centeredness in me, that if I don't get control of it, if I don't do something about that, it's going to destroy my relationships. And God says, you know how to deal with that? You choose to serve. And every time we make that decision, we take another step of breaking that power of self-centeredness in our life. Because when you said yes to Christ, you were given a power and authority over your self-centeredness. I don't know how it all works. It's, it's a miracle of God. It's something he does and works in us that can make you love someone you thought you could never love. Serve someone that you thought you could never serve. And it doesn't come naturally. It's not easy. It's not intuitive to us. But when we come to Christ, he does something in us to change us, to help us become more like him and to love others the way he loves others. It's a miracle. That's the power of this principle. You want to overcome your self-centeredness? Just go all out and serve. And isn't that true? It's awful hard to stay angry at somebody that you have chosen to serve. And it's also awful hard for, for, uh, for them to be angry at you when they choose to serve you. So let's circle back to the upper room. Let's circle back to that Last Supper. And I want us to finish by looking at this familiar story through the lens of what we've just been talking about. Okay? It's a really powerful example of what we're talking about. And as we look at the passage, there's a verse earlier in John chapter 13 that you might not remember reading before, but it puts it in an incredible context here, what we've been talking about. John chapter 13, we're back in the upper room. Jesus gathered with his disciples. I just want to read this little snippet of the life of Christ, and then I'll be done. Here's the context. Jesus is at the end of his ministry, okay? He's about to be crucified. No more miracles. It's over. And he's gathering with the, 12, with the 12 of his closest friends. All right? You with me? He's doing this for the one final meal. That's why we call it the Last Supper. Now, let me paint this picture for you. Jesus gathered with a guy named Judas, who's going to betray him. And Jesus knows that. And next to Judas is a guy named Peter who's going to deny him. And Jesus knows that. And the rest of them are all going to run away in, in Jesus' time of need. And Jesus knows that. So you've got the betrayer. You've got the denier. You've got the deserters. And they're all gathered together for this final meal. And Jesus knows all this stuff going on. Keep that in mind. John 13, 3, and this is so unbelievable. 13, 3 says, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power. Say that word power. And that he had come from God and was returning to God. Now freeze there just, just for a moment. Here's the picture of, again. Let me put it in your world. All right, think about this. You're gathered together in a room with 12 other people. One of them you know is about to stab you in the back and betray you, and then you're going to be crucified and put to death. And then another one who claims to be your biggest fan is going to deny you that they even know you, not just once, but three times. And the rest of them are all going to run off and desert you in your greatest time of need. And get this, God has given you power over everything. My question is, what would you do? What would I do? God has put all authority in your hands. There it is, all authority. And oh, by the way, this one's going to betray you, this one's going to deny you, and the rest are going to desert you, and whatever you choose to do is fine. You have all power and authority. This is so powerful. Listen to this. Listen to what Jesus' next move was. So he got up from the meal, shakes his fist at him, gives him a piece of his mind, storms out the room, and slams the door. No. That's what I'd probably do. This is what Jesus did. 
He got up from the meal. He took off his outer clothing. And he wraps a towel around his waist. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Wow. In that moment, when all power and authority was his, he could do anything he wanted to do. And the betrayers and deniers and the deserters are all in the room. And what does he do? He chooses to wash their feet. Isn't that incredible? Because when it's my moment, when my day comes and everybody's in there and they know that I'm right and they know that they're wrong and I can really at this point lay into them and point my finger at them and preach my little sermon, what do I do in those moments? Let me just tell you, the last thing I'm thinking about is serving them. Again, that doesn't come naturally to us. Serving them up, maybe. (laughs) We might think that. But serving them is the furthest thing from our mind, isn't it? Now listen, listen to how Jesus interprets this event. I want you to just listen. These verses aren't going to be on the screen, so just listen. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place at the table. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. Verse 13, you call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. In other words, capital L-O-R-D. In case you've forgotten, I am Lord. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Do you know what he did for them? He gathered the betrayers, the deniers, and the deserters, and he served them. And then a few hours later, He hung on a cross and died for their betrayal, died for their denial, died for their cowardice. And he said, now I want you to go into the world when you meet those people who betray you and deny you and desert you. I want you to leverage your freedom that I've given you and choose to serve them. To recognize their need and meet it. To figure out what they need done and do it. Not because they deserve it, but because I did that for you, Jesus says. What if we adopted that mindset? What if we adopted that mindset in our relationship and asked the question, what's their need that I can meet? What do they need done that I can do? How can I serve others? So let me ask you, as we close this time together. You got anybody in your life you're struggling to get along with? Perhaps it's gotten so bad you might even consider them an enemy? Serve them. You want to know how to build a bridge? Serve them. You want to know where to start? Serve them. Anybody stab you in the back? Betrayed your trust? Deserted you in your time of need? Maybe you're starting to feel this self-centered thing in you kind of rise up. Take it captive. Destroy it by saying, no, I'm going to serve. Perhaps you're here today and you've allowed your selfish, sinful nature to rule your relationships for years. To reign and rule your life and you're slowly destroying the relationships that you have with the people in your life that are close to you. People in your life that you would say that you love but you've not loved them by the way you're serving them. You can start today. Just choose to serve. When you do, you'll fulfill God's entire law. That can be summarized, love your neighbor, love your wife, love your husband, love your kids, love your parents, love your boss, love your employees as yourself, as I have loved you. When Mark wrote his gospel, he said it this way, for the Son of Man which is God, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. That's the ultimate act of serving love, isn't it? That Christ showed us. He gave his life for us. And the cross equals love. And so this Easter season, when you're 
viewing crosses from time to time. You're reminded, like we were today as we took communion, you're reminded of what God did for you, the sacrifice he made for you, the thing he did for you to serve you. Now you need to go and do that to others. The cross equals love. And Jesus looks at you, and Jesus looks at me, and he says, now you go do the same thing, sacrifice. And by this, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. You want to know how to build your relationships? Serve them. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, would you please in this moment work a miracle? Bring to our minds that person or persons that we've just been maybe too busy or maybe we're too angry or maybe we're too hurt to even begin to think about moving in their direction and serving them. Father, give us the courage to meet the needs that we know we can meet and to do the things that we see that needs done. Work a miracle, a miracle in our heart. This doesn't come naturally to us. You know that. Help us to love others. Father, as we get ready to go into the Easter season, as we see the crosses and are reminded again of your sacrifice and your love for us, help us to be reminded of all you went through to love us through the cross. Let us seek to love others as you have loved us. Lord, show us how to do this. Be our example. In Jesus' name, amen.